a thing there. Okay, now we are going live on YouTube as well. It says it's going and we are live. Maya is excited. All right. So we are here for some AP Euro review tonight. Tonight we are going to be focusing on the French Revolution and Napoleon. Okay, yes, and yes, this is Clifford the Big Red Dog on my Band-Aids. Actually, I've got two Band-Aids on that. I've usually got no Band-Aids on my hands, but tonight, two Band-Aids. How about that? So with that, two Band-Aids, three estates. If I had one more Band-Aid, I'd have one for each estate, right? So with that, uh, you know, and again, preference goes to questions about the French Revolution, Napoleon, and let's have a quick word from our sponsors. First of all, Romulus Euro is available at the App Store, and y'all have got it right now at number 13 in education. Now, I need to fix this uh, because the American Revolution, that's a screenshot from Romulus A Push Review, but this one here is real, okay? Ro the Romulus Euro app is just a little trivia app um, designed to help you study for AP Euro. So you can go in the Age of Absolutism, Science and Enlightenment, the French Revolution, okay? So you can actually go in there <coughs> and you can click the French Revolution. And it'll ask you a bunch of trivia questions about the French Revolution that are going to help you on your exam. A lot of times students have trouble remembering, like, you know, what was the name of this? What was that? Who was this person? This is going to help you build those connections in your brain so that you don't get stumped on the DBQ and LEQ when you have to come up with your own evidence. And you're like, gosh, I forgot what that was. So Romulus A Push Review is available at the App Store and on Google Play. Now, another thing I'm going to note here is tomorrow night, uh, I'm going to be doing a salon review. Now, this is Wednesday night. This is tomorrow night at 9.30 p.m. Eastern. This is only going to have up to 30 participants. So this is going to be a small group uh, review. And basically, that will allow me to answer everybody's questions. Okay, so um, that's going to be tomorrow. It's going to be a salon, kind of like an enlightenment salon. It's going to be limited in the number of people there. So you can go to crowdcast.io slash Tom Ritchie. If you are in the YouTube chat, you can see that there is something there for you um, to click. So that comment is pinned if you're in the YouTube chat. All right, we got Carter and Nicole. We got Billy and Charlotte, Becca and Maya. All right, good, good, good. All right, Becca is saying that she finds Romulus Euro helpful. All right, so uh, ladies and gentlemen, I think we'll focus on the 20th century perhaps uh, tomorrow. Um, but as far as this goes, all right, Jack likes the WAP parody. Okay, Peter the Great, Russian Tsar, might have heard of me. Warm water port, yeah, that's what I want to see. European tour going west, want to come with me? I'd rather die than have an overrun of me. Shave that beard, show me them lips. Better grab a hammer because I'm building ships. Sailing down to Azov for a campaign. Turks couldn't hold the place after I came. I got a warm water port ruling absolutely. Um, the light version of Romulus is actually like it's light. It just, it's a free app and it's just got a few questions. I think it's got like 10 questions for each unit. So you can download the light version if you want. Um, the uh, version for $2.99 that has the full that has hundreds of questions. So with that, ladies and gentlemen, first of all, we're going to go to causes of the French Revolution. Okay. And this is something that I've got some notes on my um, I've got some notes on my website that I'm going to share with you. Okay, so causes of French Revolution. I'm going to put a couple links here so that y'all can, uh, you know, so that y'all can see that. And so I've got a little uh, little thing here. If we're thinking about causation in the French Revolution, okay? Yes, Jude Saint John loves Romulus. Okay, thank y'all for uh, thank y'all for making Romulus Euro almost in the top ten. Um, yes, I've got the Watt parody is on my SoundCloud and also. Uh, you know, on my YouTube channel as well. It's called Ruling Absolutely. So as far as that, uh, as far as that goes now, also I should play the Napoleon song tonight. So y'all remind me about that. How many of y'all have heard the Napoleon song? Uh, you know, y'all tell me if you've heard the Napoleon song that I wrote. So causes of the French Revolution, this is on my website. And so a few things here if we're thinking about causation of the French Revolution. First of all, the French financial crisis, okay? France has lost a few wars, okay, before the French Revolution. First of all, the Seven Years War. Now, in AP U.S. history, you learn about the so-called French and Indian War, which is the North American theater of the Seven Years War. And so the Seven Years War, France lost that war, and they lost their North American colonies, uh, you know, 
which were fairly profitable, the furs in French Canada. And then France decides, you know what, we're going to get Britain back for that because 18th century warfare was all about the balance of power. And so France was like, you know what? Britain took our colonies. We're going to help Britain lose some of their colonies. And so France gave the American, uh, you know, the Americans a very generous military and financial support, sent them an army, sent them a fleet, sent them money, and this racked up debt. OK, so France, they're like, oh, we got you, Britain. And then it's like, yeah, we got you, Britain. Uh, you know, they're all of a sudden just uh, about to uh, about to go broke. Now, also, we'll note here, the royal family lived in inordinate luxury at Versailles, and there was a perception of extravagance. While other people are suffering, people hear of the extravagance at the court at Versailles. Marie Antoinette from Austria, you know, she's known as Madame Deficit, okay? And the church and the nobility. Now, note here, part of the financial crisis, it wasn't just um, the money that was going out, but also a hard time getting money to come in. It was getting difficult for the French government to collect revenue because the church and the nobility were exempt from taxation. Um, one of this head tax known as the tile, making it difficult for the government to raise revenue. Now, one thing that we can think about today in our society, we exempt churches and religious organizations from taxes. But what we've got to think about here is the church was the largest landowner in France. And so when you think about property taxes and that sort of thing, you've got all of this land where the owner is not paying any property taxes. So not only is this a spending problem, the French government has a revenue problem. And this is why Louis the 14th, I mean 16th, sorry, Louis the 16th calls the Estates General, which was a body that was more of a, you know, con consultative body. It wasn't so much a body that of people that was, uh, you know, that was um, you know, had authority to make laws, but they had authority to advise the king. Now, note here that there was also poverty among the lower classes, the working classes and the peasantry. Um, so that where you see there are grain shortages, grain shortages, higher grain prices, low, you know, which means a higher cost of living. Now, then lower wages. So basically, a lot of the, um, you know, French lower classes, the peasantry, the working class, they're caught between, uh, you know, a higher cost of food and actually, you know, their income is going down as well. Now, then we want to think about the bourgeoisie. Now, one thing that I'll that I that I get people to think about here is don't think about just the three estates. OK, you've got the clergy, the nobility and then everyone else. Uh, now, this is something I'm going to go ahead and share it with y'all, even though it's not like in a publishable form. I've just got this in a little Google Doc, but I think that this could be helpful for some of y'all as y'all are studying. So I'm going to go ahead and share this. This is something I'm working on. Again, I haven't published it yet, but I'm going to go ahead and share this with y'all. It's a little Google Drive link. Um, can I shout out to Anna and Lunas? from Hillcrest High School. Now, is that the Hillcrest High School, Annabelle, in, uh, you know, outside of Greenville, like around Simpsonville? Because that's uh, that's not too far away from me. Um, so yeah, let me know if that's the one here, up here in the upstate of South Carolina. So with that, I've got something here, the three estates explained, okay? So what were the three estates? Now, what we wanna note here is the first estate, that's the clergy. Now, then we want to think about two. The first estate has two groups within it. So the first estate, Catholic bishops, nobody's born into the first estate, okay? The first estate's the clergy. Nobody's born into it. You're not born and then like, oh, that baby is a priest. Um, that doesn't happen. You are either born into the second or the third estate. So what we want to note about the first estate is a lot of times the people in the first estate, they have sympathies with the estate of their birth. Uh, one one of the cases in point would be ABCS, who wrote, what is the third estate? I tell you what, next year, I need to get back to doing some live events, uh, you know, because when I'm doing live events, uh, you know, I'm like, what is the third estate? 
And everybody's like, everything. What has it been until now in the political order? Nothing. What does it wish to become? Something. All right. So next year, I think I'm going to get some live events going again. So Abe Siez, who was a member of the first estate, uh, Abe being a title, meaning he was an abbot of a monastery. And so he was writing in defense of the third estate, uh, you know, and that they should have more representation in the estates general. So the first estate was supported by mandatory tithes that were collected by the church from French subjects. So we want to note that before the French Revolution, the old regime, there was a state religion. Um, then the second estate, the nobility, okay, this consisted of people from noble families. Now, one thing here, as a noble, you were, um, you know, you were exempt from taxation, um, but it's at the same time, um, this is something that, you know, that didn't necessarily mean that you were wealthy, okay? So you weren't necessarily wealthy. Um, this is something that, uh, you know, there were some nobles, I mean, there are plenty of bourgeoisie that had more money than the nobility. And so with that, uh, the second estate, the nobility, now they were expected, and this is something where British nobles weren't restricted so much, which is one of the reasons given that Britain had an industrial revolution earlier on, that French nobles, they were expected to live off rents from their lands, okay? Basically to live off the produce from their lands and rents from their lands. They weren't able to invest in business enterprises, okay? So no ear, but most nobles would not have been considered wealthy. Now, the first and second estates together made up about three to 5% of the population of France. Um, and so with that, um, that the third estate, these are the taxpayers. But what we want to note here, we've actually got really three groups within the third estate. You can't take like 95 to 97% of the population and think, okay, they're all in this together. They're not. The bourgeoisie, which a lot of times referred to as a middle class, I like to use the term professional class because when we think about the bourgeoisie, this tends to be like, you know, white collar workers on, um, you know, who have some sort of education. They don't work with their hands. Okay. These are lawyers, uh, physicians, merchants, uh, you know, people who are involved in business enterprise, bankers. These are people who are bourgeoisie. And the bourgeoisie made up about, 8% of the population or so. So really between the bourgeoisie and the first two estates, you've got really barely 10% of the population. And most of the third estate delegates to the estates general are from the bourgeoisie. Now, that's not any different, different from today. If we were to look up our Congress, um, our Congress is mostly people from the bourgeoisie. Uh, lawyers, doctors, business people, teachers. Um, these are people who tend to go into politics. And so with that, we want to note that the bourgeoisie, in a lot of cases, they were uh, they were wealthy, but at the same time, or they were well off at least, but they did not have any political power and they didn't have any tax exemptions. And so what we want to note here is the bourgeoisie, their goal in, uh, you know, in going to the Estates General and then going on in the National Assembly, abolish aristocratic privilege and set up a constitutional monarchy on the British model. OK, so the French Revolution at first is really quite limited in its aims. And so the bourgeoisie, they will have the most influence during the liberal phase of the French Revolution. Remember, we've got these phases that we need to think about here. And so then the sans culottes, okay, the urban working class, the shopkeepers, the laborers, literally without breaches, okay? Now, without breaches, meaning breaches are like those, uh, you know, those pants that you see George Washington wear and stuff like that, you know, where they go down to your knees and then you've got stockings. OK, so sans culottes, they don't wear the breeches. Instead, they wear long pants. OK, so sans culottes, they don't wear breeches. Now, shopkeepers and laborers, this is the urban working class, which gives you about a quarter of the population, which means that now, you know, you're looking at, you know, less than 40 percent of the population so far. All right. So with that, um, their long pants, you know, they set them apart from the bourgeoisie. Now we want to note we associate the sans culottes with the radicalization of the uh, French Revolution. That this is, you know, as far as the sans culottes, they're the ones who are going to be most likely to support the abolition of the monarchy.
they are going to be, uh, you know, tend, they are going to tend to not uh, be very attached to the Catholic Church either. So then we see the peasantry. Now, the peasantry often get forgotten in the French Revolution, but we need to know that they're there, okay? And this is really, this is about two-thirds of the French population um, in 1789, that they were the largest single group. These are rural agriculturalists. They don't have titles of nobility. Some of them own land, okay? Don't think about all of the peasants as poor. You know, some of them own land. Remember, even when you think about Stalin, when Stalin went out to, uh, you know, in his great terror, uh, get, you know, his terror famine against the Ukrainian kulaks, uh, these are people who were land-owning peasants. So some peasants do own land and they do okay, um, but they're not nobles. Now, the peasants tended to be pretty conservative, okay, just like, uh, you know, they have that in common with most rural people today, that they're pretty conservative. They tend to support the church and support the monarchy. Um, you know, in 1789, they were complaining about the weather and bad harvest. And Napoleon, when you think about something like Napoleon's um, Concordant of 1801, where he restores Catholic worship, Napoleon was not by any means a devout Catholic or anything like that. Um, but Napoleon is thinking about what do the people want, okay? That, uh, you know, when uh, you know, when the radical revolutionaries, the Jacobins and Robespierre, when they de-Christianized France, did they ever ask the majority of the people what they wanted? And certainly they did not. And so the peasantry definitely, uh, you know, Napoleon is thinking about them with some of his policies. OK, but but really, we don't talk about the peasantry a lot, um, you know, when we're discussing the French Revolution. So then the rise of the bourgeoisie. So again, this professional class of people, they're educated, they don't work with their hands. Um, and so this is an increasingly influential class and they're wanting to create again, a constitutional monarchy that the British parliament, uh, you know, is set up to where it has a house devoted to people who are the house of commons, people who don't have a title of nobility, but you know, they have, uh, you know, money and influence. And so with that, you know, Louis, um, you know, as far as that goes, Louis kind of botched the estates general. Um, he didn't allow the delegates to vote by head, which the third estate, they were hoping for voting by head because they could uh, be joined by some of the parish priests who came from the third estate and some of the more forward and enlightenment thinking nobles. And so with that, um, you know, Louis insisted on keeping the traditional form of the estates general where each of the three estates voted as a group and without any kind of reference to their their number where the third estate represented a third of the estates general even though they represent about all of the country and that was where abc is and what is the third estate what is the third estate everything what has it been until now in the political order nothing what does it wish to become something they would have settled for just doubling their representation all they wanted was for the third estate to have half the delegates and the delegates vote by head it was something that, of course, we have to think about, too, liberalism and nationalism. When I'm explaining the French Revolution, there are a lot of different explanations. Uh, hi, Miss Matthews. Um, there are a lot of different explanations, uh, you know, for the French Revolution, but I tend to think about it being driven by, uh, you know, by liberalism and nationalism. And when you think about like voting by head, okay, so when we're thinking about voting by head, um, you know, we're thinking about, uh, you know, we're thinking about liberalism, individualism, rather than voting by group. Now, also voting by head, it takes it out of these three estates. Each of these three estates is a nation within a nation, so to speak, okay? And whereas, uh, you know, the bourgeoisie, these third estate delegates, they're saying like, you know, we should vote as a combined nation, okay? We should be one nation here. And so with that, um, yes, and uh, and I love your students uh, and your class. Thank y'all so much for everything y'all do to support my work. And so with that, um, let's see here. Shout out to Mr. Gonzalez from Ben Franklin and shout out to Mr. Woolley. Now also, I'll be doing some Instagram shout outs as well during this so at tom ritchie on instagram um, and that will be what we'll uh you know what we'll be doing here i'll be occasionally looking to see who we've got uh, as far as uh fresh new followers on instagram so 
with that, um, you know, when we think about the causes of the French Revolution, we also want to think about Enlightenment philosophy. Now, I've got a whole video series on the philosophes, these Enlightenment thinkers. Um, so, as far as that, uh, as far as that goes, um, you know, when we see uh, what we see here. Um, we've got Enlightenment philosophy, okay? So basically, when you think Locke, Voltaire, Montesquieu, and Rousseau, each having their bit of influence. Now, one uh, one video lecture that I think would be very helpful is I've got one comparing Locke and Hobbes, which a lot of people have seen, but I've got another one comparing Locke and Rousseau. Not as many people have seen that one, but I think that would be very helpful in uh, you know understanding Rousseau a bit better. All right, and then finally, the ineptitude of Louis the Sixteenth. Basically, you know, just like when you think about the Russian Revolution, Nicholas the Second, wrong guy for the wrong time. Louis the Sixteenth, wrong guy for the wrong time. Okay, that was something that uh, you know was just not so uh, was not so good. All right, so with that, y'all are free to uh, to take a look at that there. And so let's uh, go ahead and take a look. Could I could I talk about the Concordat? of 1801. Yes. Okay. So Napoleon, um, the Concordat of 1801, of course, is Napoleon restoring Catholic worship. Now, Napoleon is, uh, you know, is basically, now he's not restoring the Catholic Church as a state religion, um, but he's restoring it as what he calls the majority religion. Okay. So let me go ahead and note, uh, note this here. All right, so I've got something. I haven't put this lecture on YouTube yet, but I've got the slides finished and all of that. So, so one thing, actually, let me go ahead and make this available to you as well. Did Napoleon, you can Google even, did Napoleon betray the French Revolution? And so let me go over here and grab this. And this is available on my website, but I'm going to go ahead for your convenience. I'm going to go ahead and post it uh, and post it in the chat. All right. So as far as that goes, posting those in the chat right now. So that's, uh, you know, something that an inquiry that I went on a little bit more than a uh, little bit more than a year ago um, where I'm thinking about, OK, so Napoleon, did he betray the French Revolution? OK, um, or did Napoleon complete the French Revolution, as he would say? And so I go into this inquiry and basically, you know, I'm thinking about it in terms of a lot of times, you know, if you've ever read Madame de Stahl or you look at some of Napoleon's Napoleon's critics, I think that they look at it very narrowly because they look at, uh, you know, Napoleon, they look at the French Revolution as being about representative government, but it's not the only thing that the French, Rep what the French Revolution was about. And so with that, I know here that, uh, you know, legislative bodies had very little, if any, real power under Napoleon. OK, so Napoleon in 18. 04 basically strips the legislative body of whatever remaining power it has. So if we're going to say that the French Revolution was about representative government and only representative government, then Napoleon gets a big fat F. OK, so that's going to be something there that, uh, you know, Napoleon, a lot of times people are confused here because they think about the French Revolution as being something that is, uh, you know, that is just uh, you know, about representative government, but I'd say that it's also about popular government, equality under the law, equality of opportunity, liberalism, nationalism, and social mobility. So again, uh, representative government, not so much. But what about the idea of popular government, the idea that government comes from the people? Now, as far as that goes, Napoleon did not just, you know, we hear that story about Napoleon crowning himself emperor. But what we need to note here is Napoleon was made emperor by the Constitution of uh, the year, uh, whatever it was, 1804. I lose track of the French Revolutionary years. Maybe it was the Constitution of the year 12 or something like that. But whatever it was, it was the Constitution of 1804. So 1804, like Napoleon, puts the vote um, to the people and says, I want you to vote on this constitution. Now, would this election necessarily, uh, you know, get, uh, you know, pass our scrutiny today? Um, but as far as that goes, I mean, we don't uh, even completely trust our own elections in the world today when you look at different, uh, you know, different countries and their elections and that sort of thing. But what matters here when you look at the context of the time is that Napoleon is even asking. 
Okay, so Napoleon is asking the people, maybe asking them imperfectly, but at the same time, he is asking and he's acknowledging at least the existence of social contract theory. So when you think about Rousseau and Rousseau saying government is by social contract, that Napoleon's constitutions were ratified by, you know, each by a national referendum or plebiscite. So this acknowledges popular sovereignty that Napoleon, even though he's ruling in the style of an absolute monarch, he is, you know, ruling in a way that is, uh, you know, that is saying the people are ultimately in charge. Napoleon called himself emperor of the French, not emperor of France. Okay. Which uh, that's something that when you think about the French revolution of 1830, for example, the Bourbon restoration monarchs, they called themselves kings of France. And then the French revolution of 1830, when it put Louis Philippe on the throne, he called himself king of the French and they called him the citizen king. And so with that, Napoleon is acknowledging that the people are ultimately in charge of the government and he's governing on their behalf. So the Concordat of 1801, again, it is recognizing Catholicism as the majority religion, okay? And so another thing, when we think about the French Revolution, you know, liberté, égalité, fraternité, uh, you know, equality under the law. And so when we think about this, men are born and remain free and equal in rights, okay? So the Napoleonic Code, this is a single set of laws for all of France. And this doesn't say that this is a set of laws for these people. And then this estate and that estate, um, we don't see a return of the estate system. Okay. Now, Napoleon, sometimes people say, well, you know what? He did roll back um, divorce rights from, you know, that uh, were given to women. You know, women had equal divorce rights and also no fault divorce, which today, um, you know, a no fault divorce is something that, uh, you know, this is something that. In a no-fault divorce, it's just basically where that's the most common form of divorce today is that, uh, you know, the couple just decides, you know, we're no longer staying married. And this is something that during the reign of terror, if you weren't getting your head cut off, you could have a no-fault divorce, even if you were a man or a woman. Now, what happened here, though, is Napoleon, he tightened up the standards from divorce relative to the reign of terror. So, you know, and also had different standards for women. So, uh, you know, a if a man uh, found out that his wife was cheating on him, then he could divorce her based on that. But a wife could only say, you know, hey, my husband brought his mistress into the family home and embarrassed me. OK, so Napoleon, we're not going to say he was any kind of like fan of gender equality or something like that. But at the same time, we do want to know, even though, you know, when we think about comparing the divorce laws to today. But what about if we're comparing the divorce laws to the old regime or what if we're comparing them to other European countries at that time? And so what we want to understand is, you know, before the French Revolution, there were no divorce rights whatsoever because uh, the Catholic Church controlled marriage. It was a, seen as a function of the church, not a civil function. And so the Catholic Church even today does not recognize divorce. Now, another thing that we want to note here is that either party could file for divorce on grounds of cruelty, injury, a criminal conviction. These were things that were not available in the old regime. So even though some people like to point a finger at Napoleon, you know, when you think about the con Context, okay. The other thing is that Britain, it was not until 1857 that Britain had a general civil divorce law. So we think about Henry VIII, he got to do what he did because he was the king. Before 1857, if you wanted to get a divorce in, uh, in Britain, you had to basically get parliament to pass a private act, like basically parliament on your behalf declares you divorced. If you weren't well connected, you couldn't have that sort of thing. So with that, equality of opportunity, that's another thing if we think about the French Revolution, is the ability to make it even if you're not born into one of these top influential families. And so Napoleon expanded education in what are known as lycees. So he set up a system of government-run prep schools. So there was more access to education. 
Now, if you could pass an exam, you could actually get into the YC without uh, paying tuition. Like if your family could not afford to send you to school, you could actually, I mean, this is a meritocracy. So Napoleon is bringing, uh, you know, is bringing in this idea that you should get, uh, you know, you should get access to education based on merit, not based on, uh, you know, your family's influence or the ability of your family to pay if you show that you are deserving of, uh, you know, of state funds for education. And so when we think about classical liberalism, Napoleon's going to have kind of a mixed record here. Napoleon certainly did have uh, censorships, uh, you know, censorship. And so he employed censors. Um, if uh, something was critical of him or the French government or it was, uh, you know, atheistic or something like that, it wouldn't get published or it'd get modified. But the other thing is, let's remember that the French Revolution, I mean, you know, freedom of the press, that wasn't a press that you heard there. I mean, that's a, that's a guillotine, okay? So the French Revolution, like, you know, how liberal were some of these other phases, uh, if you think about it? And so with that, you know, we note as well, though, with uh, if we're thinking about classical liberalism, the Concordant of 1801. Now, even though, yes, if you want to be truly liberal, you take the church and the state and you put them like you hear, you hear. OK, but but with the Concordant of 1801, um, that Napoleon, when he says that, uh, you know, Catholicism is the majority religion, other religions will be tolerated, okay? So, in, and later on, there's actually funds uh, that are taken to support Protestant churches right along with uh, right along with the Catholic church. So, another thing here is I think that we need to note here that, you know, Napoleon is advancing nationalism, okay? And that's the thing. When I think about the, uh, you know, about the French Revolution, I think about liberalism and nationalism. Shout out to... Uh, Abana Sang P, um, J Hayes 03, E Matheos, uh, Liz Douglas, M4 Cat, and S G T R Nat. Okay, newest followers on Instagram. Thank y'all so much. So, nationalism and the French Revolution. Okay, so first of all, a national law code, a code that, you know, the Napoleonic Code replaced a bunch of regional law codes. There was no uniformity in the law before Napoleon. You know, as much as Louis XIV said, one king, one law, one faith, uh, Louis XIV was not quite able to completely get to one law. Napoleon, he did that, okay, that he gave France a single law code. Now, also, Napoleon kept using the tricolor flag, this symbol of French nationalism that the Bourbon Restoration monarchs, they abandoned that. Now, another thing about the Concordat, the Concordat can be looked at from so many different angles. Um, the return of the national religion, okay, that basically Catholicism, even though people don't have to be Catholic, you know, this is France's religion, okay? So it's like if you are religious and you're French, odds are you are Catholic. And Napoleon said, uh, you know, during his hundred days between his two exiles, um, you know, he made a, uh, you know, a pronouncement to the, uh, to the army. And he said, the national colors shall fly from steeple to steeple all the way to the towers of Notre Dame. Okay. And so this is something that, you know, when it comes to nationalism, Napoleon is, is really, I mean, he is excelling here. Um, French is the only language of instruction at the Lycees. Justice is blind, but she speaks French, okay? That if you go into a court of law anywhere in France, you're not going to be speaking a regional language, which keep this in mind that Napoleon, you know, he learned his own regional language before he uh, learned French, okay? But you see because of Napoleon, a decline in the use of all these regional languages that had been used in France. Now, the other thing that we wanna note here is that Napoleon represented the peak of French national greatness, okay? So this is something that, you know, France was never greater at any point during its existence, I would argue. I mean, this here, the Arc de Triomphe, which uh, is really a general French military monument today, but it was built uh, to memorialize Napoleon. Now, remember, this is during the neoclassical art period. And so this is the apex of France's military power. Um, Napoleon 
Napoleon's tomb in Paris is, I mean, it is magnificent. I mean, you've got here, uh, you know, just uh, Napoleon doesn't even have a name there because they couldn't actually agree on what to put there. Do they put Napoleon Bonaparte or do they put Napoleon or Napoleon, you know, so, you know, do we recognize him as emperor or do we bury him as a private citizen? They decided that we'll just, we'll just put nothing there. And, you know, you've got a dozen angels there that are, you know, surrounding, uh, you know, surrounding Napoleon. Now, as far as that, uh, that goes, I wonder how many of y'all have heard the, uh, you know, have heard the Napoleon song that I wrote a couple years ago. Let me see here. Um, you know, I have, uh, let's see, I have heard the, you know, Richie's Napoleon song. Okay. So yes. And not yet. Okay. So actually, you know what? I actually do not have my guitar. I'm going to have to save that. Um, I'm going to have to save that for Thursday because I actually brought my acoustic guitar to work. Okay. So now it is on my SoundCloud if you want to hear it. Okay. But, uh, but as far as that puts you in the elect, that's great Calvinism reference, Dylan. So, uh, so I will on remind me on Thursday, I need to play the Napoleon song. The Napoleon song is on my SoundCloud. If you just search for Tom Ritchie SoundCloud, you'll, uh, you'll find it. So with that, um, the Concordat of 1801 basically got Napoleon, you know, it got him support from among French, uh, you know, from among French Catholics and from those traditional elements who were really not, uh, you know, who were really not in, uh, you know, not big fans of that. Do I have a podcast? I do have a podcast. I I post on it sporadically and I need to make it a regular thing. I think it's been over a year since I've updated it, but you can find if you're on Spotify or on, uh, you know, iTunes or whatever, you can find the Tom Ritchie podcast. So the war of the Spanish succession. Okay. Now, Iris, I have a, um, a complete lecture on this. Okay. The war of the Spanish succession is the last and most important of Louis the 14th wars. Okay. And so what happens here um, is the war, of the Spanish succession starts when, uh, of course, you've got, um, you know, Charles II of Spain, who's a lot different from Charles II of, uh, you know, of England and Scotland. Uh, you know, Charles II of England and Scotland, he had all of these like illegitimate children. Charles II of Spain, he did not have any children at all. And so the thing is, this is the guy who's like the butt of like every, uh, you know, of every joke here. Um, let's see, where are we going to find? I need to find the war of the, you know, so let's see, Louis XIV's wars. Okay. And again, I've got a proper lecture on the war of the Spanish succession, but why not, uh, you know, why not say something about it here since someone's asking? Okay. So we're going to reach back into the age of, of absolutism and let's go ahead and take a look here. The war of the Spanish succession. 1701 to 1714. So basically here is Europe um, before and then, you know, Europe after. Okay. So it doesn't make like a huge difference here. Um, but as far as that, uh, as far as that goes, this is uh, Louis XIV's last most important war. And so Charles II of Spain, a Habsburg, he died without an heir. Now notice that Habsburg, that notable Habsburg chin or Habsburg jaw. Basically, Charles II, uh, according to this graphic I found on Reddit a while back, Charles II is inbred level five, okay? And so what happens here is the Habsburgs have done so much inbreeding that finally Mother Nature just decides to just turn off the tap, okay, that there's not going to be an inbred level six. All right, so sorry, Habsburgs, game over, okay, Charles will not be able to have a child. And so the French throne is vacant. Well, Charles, uh, you know, leaves the, uh, leaves the throne to Louis XIV's grandson. And so with that, um, that starts a war because if the Bourbons get the Spanish throne, then that is going to throw off the balance of power. And so with that, the Grand Alliance, okay, a Grand Alliance forms against Louis the Fourteenth. And basically, I mean, what is interesting here, you know, Voltaire wrote, Voltaire wrote, okay, Voltaire wrote, the king was surrounded by enemies on all sides, okay? And so you note here that Louis is fighting practically all of, you know, Central and Western Europe. And 
you know, at first he was defeated, but uh, the Allies could not, once they got into French territory, they could not score a decisive victory. So this is really, uh, I would say that it's a dub for Louis um, because he is able to fight to a draw when he has all of these, uh, you know, all of these enemies arrayed against him. And so the Treaty of Utrecht, uh, as the Dutch would say it, uh, you know, they would say, uh, you know, the Treaty of Utrecht is, uh, you know, this treaty that ends the war of the Spanish succession. OK, and uh, I'm sure uh, I'm sure Dylan is, uh, you know, familiar with the Treaty of Utrecht, um, SS2, ITP, Dolls Art. Oh, do we have some art here? And Savannah um, Haughty, Savannah. OK, so, yeah, gosh, that is a lot of uh that is a lot of art there. All right. So uh, so there we go. Uh, Michael Peters, uh, Christian and Jude and Lacrosse is Lacrosse. That's like your name. Um, so that's interesting. So basically, the Treaty of Utrecht, um, as the Dutch would say it, they say the Bourbon monarch can rule in Spain, but there has to be an agreement that the French and Spanish kings will renounce the claims to the other's throne. So there will not be a unified Bourbon monarchy. Now, one thing to note, Spain, even today, is a constitutional monarchy. So there is no monarch in France. France is a republic, but there still is a Bourbon monarchy in Spain, which is a relic of the, uh, you know, of the Treaty of Utrecht. And so France will be restricted to its pre-war borders. And then Britain will get Gibraltar from Spain. Now, that's something that Gibraltar is still, uh, you know, is still a British territory, territorial possession. Now, what we want to note here is how forward thinking Britain is, OK, because, you know, Louis is concerned about his dynasty. Louis wants to expand the Bourbon dynasty at the expense of the Habsburgs. Now, the British are thinking, OK. How about you go ahead and you can, uh, you know, you can have that, Louis. Um, but at the same time, um, what uh, what we're going to see, what we're going to see from there is the British are like, we want a naval base. OK, we want a naval base um, there in southern Spain at the mouth of the Caribbean. OK, so that's what we're going to see. Uh, you know, what we're going to see there is that uh, that Britain is already thinking about worldwide naval superiority. So that's what's really going to put Britain on a path to becoming like the preeminent naval power and really the preeminent wor world power, if you think about it. OK, so as far as that goes, that's the Treaty of Utrecht. And that is where the British have Gibraltar, which is right there. I mean, it is in Spain controlling the, you know, the entrance to the Mediterranean Sea. And this is actually when you look at like the Battle of uh, the Battle of Trafalgar, OK, which was fought in this area here, OK, where Admiral Lord Nelson beat Napoleon, defeated Napoleon's Navy. Um, you know, Britain is, all, you know, they're looking at a worldwide military presence. So that's one thing that you want to think of with Britain um, is their, uh, you know, is their ascendancy. And so with that, uh, you know, the, you know, as far as German unification, um, I have a three part series on German unification, blood and iron. But you know what? Um, let's see. So the uh, let's see. Um, let me see if I can actually um, find what I'm looking for here, because I've got that one. Um, let's see, Bismarck. Okay, do y'all want to hear my Bismarck rap? Okay, y'all are asking about German unification. All right, so uh, let me know in the chat if y'all want to hear this, okay? Because I don't want to burden your ears. If y'all are like, Richie, we don't want to hear you rap. We're trying to prepare for AP Euro. Y'all let me know, okay? So, uh, okay, so let me see here. And let me just make sure I've got all of the uh, all of the lyrics and all of that kind of stuff here. All right. So where are those uh, those lyrics? OK, so. Uh, OK, so uh, let's see. Bismarck rap there. OK, so let me check the YouTube chat. Do y'all want to hear me rap? OK, the square child. All right. So, OK, so y'all are I mean, I just I didn't want to offend anybody here or anything like that. OK. All right. So let's go. Y'all want to do it? OK, so let's go ahead and uh, and do that there. All right. All right. Hey there. All right. So now this is on my SoundCloud if you want to hear it. All right. So uh, SoundCloud, just type in Tom Ritchie SoundCloud. 
All right, so got some German states out there need to be unified. Blood and iron, more like blood and bars. Oh, oops, that just, that took off without me. Okay, let me try this one more time. Okay, there we go. I'm the Iron Chancellor, and I've got a, wait, what? Wait, sorry. Um, <laughs> I tell you what, uh, wait, I'm looking for the pause button. This, these are not the, wait, I need to go to the SoundCloud, get the lyrics from there. Okay. So, uh, SoundCloud, let's see, uh, Tom Reed. Okay. So, uh, sorry about that. I'm not going to, uh, I'm not going to disappoint y'all, but there was some, yes, an obligation. Okay. I was looking at some old lyrics. I was like, wait, those aren't the latest lyrics. Okay. That was like the first draft or something like that. Uh, of course, the Metternich rap could be, uh, could be relevant as well. So y'all, uh, you know, let's see, let's see. Y'all might not want to hear a lot of rapping. Okay. So as far as that goes, let's, uh, let's get this going. All right. So there we go. Looks like we've got some German states out there need to be unified. Blood and iron, more like blood and bars. I'm the Iron Chancellor, and I feel an obligation. Unify the German states under Prussian domination, a conservative in part. But I've got a little trick. It's the politics of power. Call it real politics. An alliance with the liberals, because I'm industry emphatic, and they're secular. They like my culture comp against the Catholics and the social democrats, because I'm gonna put it bluntly that Germany will never be a socialist country. I've got old age pensions and some accident insurance. If you're hurt at work, I've got your back. You've got my reassurance. Call it state socialism. Now the liberals want to hate, but without the working classes, we can't unify the state. The position of Prussia in Germany at this hour will not be determined by its liberalism, but its power. Great questions aren't decided by speeches or majorities. It's blood and iron. I'll use war to spread authority with the Austrians as allies. We took Schleswig and Holstein, then declared war on Austria. The next step in my grandeza. Russia won in seven weeks. Austria wasn't any match. Then it's time to provoke France with the M's dispatch. Mulkey led a modern army armed with telegraphs and trains. France decisively defeated, gave up Alsace and Lorraine after unifying Germany. Then I really had some clout. Now it's 1890 and I, I'm out. All right. So, ladies and gentlemen, that is the Bismarck rap. You can find that on my SoundCloud, okay? So, uh, so that is uh, even Peter the Great there. Okay, so, ladies and gentlemen, uh, yeah, that's the Bismarck rap. Okay, thank you, uh, Milana. Um, leaving no crumbs. I'm going to take that as a. Uh, I'm going to take that as a as a compliment. Okay. So with that, now it's not the fish band aid. Okay. These are uh, just to be clear. And for whatever reason, I just hurt two of my fingers in the same week. Um, these are Clifford the Big Red Dog band aids. Okay. So that's something. Can you get a shout out? Yeah, Ethan, you can get a shout out. All right. So uh, as far as that goes, ladies and gentlemen. Now the bit where like. The bit where it says, like, I, this is almost verbatim from his speech, where I said, the position of Prussia in Germany at this hour will not be determined by its liberalism, but its power. Great questions aren't decided by speeches or majorities. It's blood and iron. I'll use war to spread authority. Okay. Now that's actually, it's a little bit, uh, but, but it's basically the substance of the off quote, quoted part of the speech that basically the Frankfurt parliament in 1848 tried to unify Germany on the basis of liberal nationalism and that failed. And that's where Bismarck says, you know, this is going to be about blood and iron, you know? So if you remember that part there, okay. Um, so, uh, you know, if you just like put that part to memory and the, uh, you know, the verse form, like the poetic form of like rapping, you can kind of remember the speech because I fool around with the words a little bit to make them fit in there. So again, the position of Prussia in Germany at this hour will not be determined by its liberalism, but its power. Okay. So great questions aren't decided by speeches or majorities. It's blood and iron. I'll use war to spread authority. So that's where Bismarck uses 
the wars of German unification, you know, the wars of German unification, um, which is uh, the Franco-Prussian War is the last one of those. So with that, and I've got those on my YouTube channel, I've got proper uh, lectures. Um, can you say I'll get a five on the exam? I don't know about that. I don't know about that. Uh, I will get a five on the exam. If I took the exam, I'd get a five, right? Um, so as far as that, uh, as that goes, now also before I sign off, I'll do the Metternich rap. Uh, you know, so uh, that I that I'll do that for you. Usually, I've got the first, and I can just do that one a cappella. So let's get a few of these. Let's get this bread. Okay. So with that, um, and Paul Sargent, my friend Paul Sargent has a great uh, video lecture on uh, Italian unification. Okay. So uh, you know, so as far as that uh, as that goes, um, how did Napoleon you influence people outside of France? Also, oh wait, you know what? Um, actually. Goya, 3rd of May. Ladies and gentlemen, 3rd of May alert. Okay, check this out. Check this out. Okay, so we got Cameron asking, how did Napoleon influence people outside of France? Okay, this is, it is May 3rd. May the 3rd be with you. That's not Star Wars. That's Napoleon's uh, army, you know, telling these Spanish guerrillas, may the third be with you. Bam. OK. And so that's uh, now, of course, guerrilla warfare. This actually comes from the, uh, you know, the war here between Napoleon's forces and these Spanish partisans who were, um, you know, La Petite Guerre, which is which is French for little war. And then in Spanish, the same term is guerrilla. OK. And so the the thing is, like, you know, if you want to kind of do this one day early, like tomorrow's the Star Wars day, you know, it's like, you know, may may the third be with you. Bam. You know, and that is Napoleon's troops to the Spanish uh, guerrillas. Um, and so with that, you know, you see not only is Napoleon like a catalyst for French nationalism, but you start to see these nationalistic values of the French Revolution spread. And especially as people are being conquered by Napoleon's forces. So one thing we want to note here is that, uh, you know, is that Napoleon's, uh, you know, Napoleon's um, armies, they're not only spreading French nationalism, but as a result, you've got Spanish nationalism. You've got Russian nationalism. Uh, you've got these, you know, that basically the Russians, you know, they fight to get Napoleon out of the country. And this is something that brings together the Russian people. And so Napoleon spreading nationalism sometimes unwittingly. I need to get a shirt that like says, would y'all buy that shirt? Like may the third be with you. Uh, I tell you, I think that that is like the best idea I've had all day. OK, all day long. May the third be with you. OK, so that's something like I should totally do. May the third be with you. Our Oh, Miss Snyder's AP Euro class. They love me and I love Miss Snyder, ladies and gentlemen. Um, yes, um, we've got uh, y'all outside of uh, outside of L.A. I would have it in just about any other situation. I just forget the exact. Um, oh, my goodness. But yes, I know where y'all are right outside of L.A. there. Um, so with that, uh, Miss uh, Mr. Donovan's fifth period, please. All right. So uh, so yeah. So uh, I should have. You know, I think next time I'm going to be. Uh, you know, going into. Um, you know, I'm going to go into the third of May and just be like, May the third be with you. All right, Mr. Brown's class, excellent, excellent, and Mr. Uh, Mr. Beatty from Bayport. Thank you so much, and Kaylee Alexis. Okay. So uh, so with that. Um, Let's see. Um, as far as that goes, Danny, I don't know. I'm not going to post documents for like this, the documents I post. Like I'm going to go right from this session to a multiple choice strategy session from a push. So as far as like documents that are posted now, if you're on the Crowncast, you can go back to those broadcasts and you should be able to click things that have been posted in other broadcasts. So with that, ladies and gentlemen, oh, Miss Bear is, oh my goodness. Uh, yes, it's time for some Dodger baseball. Um, Jude, I am so, uh, so glad that Miss Bear's uh, students are here. That warms my heart, heart officially warmed. Okay, YouTube, does YouTube do super chats? Um, You know, great. oh, you know what, actually, let's see. Yeah, they do do super chats. I've got like a dollar sixty four on the super chat that came from uh, Abon, let's see, Abonasan GP. Shout out to Miss Latam. 
first year teaching euro if i didn't say that correctly it's a written test right um but miss latam shout out to miss latam okay so we're gonna say shout out to miss latam first year teaching ap euro dramatic pause shout out to miss latam first year teaching ap euro dramatic pause all right so let's see how that works all right so with that ladies and gentlemen it has been a great uh you know miss woodard's class at phs Thank y'all so much, ladies and gentlemen. Miss Stone has students here as well. Now, remember that I'm going to be here again at, uh, you know, at 8 o'clock p.m. tomorrow, again at 8 o'clock p.m. on Thursday. And remember at 9.30 p.m., like after tomorrow's public broadcast, I will be doing a salon review that's going to have, uh, you know, just uh, me and a small group of people we're going to be reviewing together. So with that, ladies and gentlemen, tomorrow, I think that I'll take y'all's advice and we'll focus on the 20th century. And then, of course, uh, you know, the night before Euro is typically a free for all. We're just going to see what questions people are asking. So as far as that uh, goes, yes, got to sign off with the Metternich rap. All right. Congress of Vienna, right? What up, Europeans? It's the ladies pick. Austrian Prince Clemens von Metternich. Aristocracy, savior, I'm the man of the hour. Gonna carefully restore Europe's balance of power. Eat nationalists for breakfast, liberals for my dinner. Gotta be conservative if you wanna be a winner. I'm the coach man of Europe, so you better hold your horses because all the great powers are about to join forces. Napoleon thought he was too big for Elba, so we put him on a boat straight to St. Helena. Threatened European peace, so we set him adrift. Shake the French Revolution off like Taylor Swift. Come on, Talleyrand, take a seat at the table because Europe needs a France that is strong and stable. There's no need to punish France. I just want to keep order and restore the old 1791 borders. The liberals have ideas that they want to express, but I shut their mouths up when I censor the press. Stability within and between European states. This is current. It's the it's ugh. stability within and between European states. It's the conservative order that I want to create. So join me in Vienna where a Congress is in session. Together we can stop the revolution from progressing. This conservative order, no, it ain't going to fall because I build coalitions like Trump builds walls. <laughs> All right. So with that, and that one's on my SoundCloud as well. And that was actually, I think, on YouTube too. So as far as that goes, yeah, if you just look up Tom Ritchie SoundCloud, you'll get uh, the raps and the Napoleon song. Now, remember Thursday, I need to bring my guitar and I need to play the Napoleon song, but I'm actually uh, doing an April push review session with my own students on Thursday and I brought my guitar so that I could play my American system song and all of that kind of stuff. So ladies and gentlemen, again, thank y'all so much. It has been a pleasure, my utmost pleasure. And I will be back tomorrow evening at eight o'clock PM Eastern and uh, y'all go and, uh, you know, get that, uh, get that studying on. Let's get this bread.